we are recording uh, this session so that our friends who couldn't be here can access it later. Uh, so please note that it will record both our screens and the chat. Um, we've muted all your lines as we meet our featured guest, Dr. John Kirchhoff. For optimal viewing experience, you should select the speaker view, which can be found in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Also, we ask that you keep those lines muted for the duration of the program. Uh, we'll get started by asking our, uh, by our guest uh, with a presentation, but at any time you can ask a question in the chat by clicking on the word bubble label chat in the user menu at the bottom of your screen. I'm thankful for your patience in advance uh, and as we uh, navigate the ins and outs of the technology. So thank you. Without question, COVID-19 has taken a significant toll on our markets, government, and populations worldwide. The global supply chain is one of the most visible and uh, immediately tangible issues. Today, Dr. Kirchhoff will discuss the global supply chain pre and post pandemic and uh, how the country is dealing with the dramatic changes in the way businesses operate and what to expect as the new norm. He'll share his expertise with us today and we're going to take away uh, an understanding of what supply chain management is and how it works, how consumer and demand uh, affect product availability, We'll gain some insight into the future of supply chain and the new normal going forward uh, and solve the mystery of what really happened uh, to the toilet paper and some of our other favorite items. Uh, so now let's introduce our, our guest. Dr. Kirchhoff is an associate professor in marketing and supply chain management department in the College of Business at ECU. Dr. Kirchhoff is also an affiliate faculty with the Center of Sustainable Tourism he earned his PhD with a concentration in logistics and supply and chain management from the University of Tennessee, but I like him anyway. Prior to completing his PhD, he worked in the industry for over 14 years with companies as diverse as Mercedes-Benz, US International Echo Star, Satellite Systems, and OEA Aerospace. His research interests focus on emerging issues in global supply chain management and include environmentally responsible practices in uh, supply chain management. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, Dr. Kirchhoff, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks a lot, Scott. And uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for uh, joining uh, us today, for joining me today. Um, I um, hope I can bring some interesting insight to uh, supply chain management. Um, and uh, to what's going on uh, in the world today and, and give you some insights, maybe some things that uh, you know, maybe some things that you don't know. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and hang on just a second here to make sure I um, get this right because I, um, there we go. Hopefully you can all see the screen. And uh, uh, yeah, so so the title of course is uh, what happened to the toilet paper um, and other supply chain management topics. And what I'll probably do uh, is I'm going to kind of start with the other supply chain topics and then we'll, uh, we'll move to the what happened to the toilet paper. So um, uh, just a, a little bit about me. Uh, Scott already gave some of an introduction. I spent about 15 years in industry working for uh, OEA Aerospace. That was in um, uh, Aurora, Colorado. And then I was there about three years. Um, I spent about five, six years at Mercedes-Benz US International, both in Germany and in the United States building a new SUV. And, uh, and then I spent about five years, uh, six years at EchoStar, a dish satellite uh, back in Denver. Uh, I realized that uh, I needed to move on um, from industry. I enjoyed industry, but I felt my talents were maybe used better elsewhere. And so I started and completed my um, PhD at uh, the University of Tennessee in the House of Columbus Business. And here I am at ECU. So that, that's just a little bit about my background and a picture of me in, uh, in better days. Uh, so let's, let's get into supply chain management. And as I mentioned, some of you may already be familiar with it. So this, um, some of this might be stuff that you, you do now that you work in, or it might be something that you're not really familiar with. Um, my father-in-law, uh, I've been married 20 years. My father-in-law told my wife a couple of months ago, um, hey, this supply chain stuff that John is, 
has been studying and working in, and that's pretty interesting stuff, you know, uh, at, at, like the light went on, you know, and I think the pandemic has done that. Suddenly the word supply chain has gotten out to anybody, every, everybody. So uh, let, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So I'm going to start with... Um, Don, can I stop you for your screen? Uh, I can't see your screen. You cannot know. see my screen. Okay, hang on just a second. Ah, I see. I see what happened. Uh, there we go. And now I've got a, what looks like it might be Aurora, Colorado. Beautiful. Uh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, I forgot to hit the share. So, so that's the uh, that was all you missed in the first two uh, uh, screens. So there we go. Um, all right. So. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about this just for a minute from the aspect of consumers. You know, I think about supply chain. Well, supply chain includes us as consumers, um, and so here's a a box of, of products, and this is from Amazon, and this is a um, a box uh, from my house. And you'll see there's you know three products in here. All right, you've got a, a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving DVD um, article of clothing, and some cat food tiki cat. Uh, Aloha friends or Aloha friendly for our, for the cat, um, and really three disparate products. Uh, honestly, uh, in fact, a, a colleague of mine said here said, "Where do you even get a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving DVD? Where do you where does that even come from?" Of course, um, you know Amazon uh, as as cultured us has has prompted us to be. Um, very expect have expectations and so three very disparate things and of course the three things they have in common i would argue is that, that customer expectations that we now have that ability to go out um into the world into the supply chains of the world and find all these things and may in one company can provide them all to us um whether for better or for worse companies like amazon have rapidly changed how we deal in supply chain management so uh, who fulfills those customer expectations? Well, of course, you can already guess the answer given the topic of what we're talking about today, and that's our uh, the global supply chain. And you can see here global supply chains for five different um, products, uh, iPhone, uh, laptop computers, um, jeans, pharmaceuticals, and Toyota cars, which span every continent except Antarctica, uh, either raw materials, production or where the customers are then someday maybe Antarctica is going to, to join this okay so so let's uh, before I define supply chain management um, let's look at it uh, let's look up from an illustration standpoint okay um, so what's the supply chain thing we all hear about or, or maybe that we even work in and uh, I'll use coffee as a, a, a an example product uh, most of us enjoy our coffee. Uh, some of us are very passionate about our coffee. And you can see that that we'll call this the upstream supply chain. That's that's the suppliers, all right? And you have the supplier suppliers, all right? And those are what we call the nth tier, uh, letter nth tier, meaning everything further upstream. And then there's our suppliers that are closer to the company, we'll call them first or second tier. And you'll see that these are raw materials. We have raw beans. Um, maybe the blank cups or paper and some other things. And, and those raw materials are uh, processed and they become maybe components that go into uh, something that, the, into the internal supply chain. So here we have coffee roasters and, and that's the manufacturing and operation. So the raw materials then are upstream. All our manufacturing operations are internal supply chain. And then downstream, of course, is the customer. And the customer, for Starbucks, a customer can be their own baristas and their own stores. It can be uh, buying this in bulk uh, at a grocery store. It can be you're at a conference and they have Starbucks in the break room, those kinds of things. And then of course the consumer. So that's the downstream supply chain. Uh, upstream supply chain, supplier, supplier, internal supply chain, and then downstream supply chain, customers are customers, customers are the consumers. So that's an, an illustrated look um, at this simple coffee supply chain but you know coffee and i won't talk about this very long but this illustration there's here's um 10 steps eight of which uh seven to eight of which are part of the supply chain that gets coffee to us and coffee 
uh, let's face it, for the most part is a very simple product, right? The bean, water, okay, and then whatever that you want to put into it. And there's processes that go along. But you can see here, this 10 steps from shrub to mug actually is rather complex and it is global in nature. Growing the beans, picking them, processing them, milling, the roasting, packaging and shipping, grinding, whether that happens at home or somewhere else, the brewing the same, and then us that are drinking it. And this doesn't include some of the intermediary steps that happen in supply chain, uh, some of the other transportation, inventory, storage, and maybe some of the other processing. So when you see this as a fairly simplistic version of a supply chain, how about this? You know, this is for a laptop and, and, and honestly, this isn't even all the steps in the laptop that includes uh, raw material extraction, raw material processing, component manufacturing and processing assemblies. And there's customers somewhere in here, but you can see uh, supply chains, global supply chains are very complex. And, and so they have to be managed, right? Um, that there's a kind of an old saying um, that uh, globalization happens, well, supply chains happen. They, they happen and companies that are going to um, be good at supply chain management, companies that are going to use it to create a competitive advantage for themselves are going to manage those supply chains. And so if we look at supply chain management, that is really what I call the active management of all of these activities and all the relationships that go for everything from product development, your sourcing, your production, logistics and movement, and all the information systems that needed to coordinate uh, the activities. And I say active because um, for years and years, companies, um, that you talked about supply chain management as trucks and sheds, and that really meant moving the product removing inventory and restoring inventory. And the people that worked in supply chain management or logistics or purchasing were kind of in the back of the, of, of the building. And then they didn't come out, didn't see the light of day. They just weren't as important today. And that, that changed decades ago. And certainly today, it's very, very critical. Those companies that have built themselves on supply chain management, creating a competitive advantage, Dell, Apple, Walmart, and Amazon are all um, companies that have done that. And there's many, many others. So there's, there's two goals of supply chain management that I teach in my class. One is maximize customer value to create a competitive advantage for the company, but, but not just a, just a competitive advantage, but one that can be sustained over time. But the second goal then is managing supply chains in the most efficient and effective way possible balancing the two, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, manage the supply chain in this efficient and effective way, balancing the two. And this is a concept that I, I reiterate during my classes over and over again, and certainly when I'm uh, talking to, to industry folks like yourself. And if you look at these two, I, I call them efficiency and effectiveness. Okay, so the same idea. And efficiency is doing more with less. And, and I use that as a cost reduction. Effectiveness is achieving the goal or customer service. And these are uh, two sides of the same coin, all right? Two sides of the same coin in that companies should not try to be one over the other all the time or get too far in one direction. And you, you can go uh, online and you have it in your own organizations where uh, there's a discussion of a being efficient, like hammer, hammer, being efficient, or uh, being effective. We have customer service. The customer is always right. That's what my students will say. I'll talk about this, and I'll have essays with them, and I'll talk about what is the relationship with efficiency, effectiveness. And then they'll say the customer is always right. The customer is always right. Well, what I teach is there has to be a balance. So I'm going to give you a two extremes here of how runaway effectiveness or runaway efficiencies in supply chains and in companies can really drive them off a cliff. Uh, I'll start with effectiveness. Some of you might remember the dot-com boom that uh, happened back in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. There was a company called Pets.com. And I have a quote here, Pets.com tried to build a customer base by offering discounts and free shipping, All right? Does that sound familiar? Uh, there's, you know, companies today that can do that. But the companies today have learned, right? 
this, how to balance this with efficiency. In the end, pets.com sold product for approximately one third of the cost it was to buy it. So you can see very quickly without doing much math, uh, they were going to run themselves into trouble if they are losing that much money on every product. That is too much effectiveness. That's too much customer service. I have many other examples, and I'm sure all of you probably have examples of those too. Efficiency, there's many examples of being too efficient. Here was a company, Limkin. They are an agricultural uh, uh, product uh, machinery company. And they, to gain more efficiencies, they move their factories from Germany and production to another country where the efficiency started to quickly erode. The quick rise in material cost hits efficiency. Poor labor productivity hits efficiency. The other thing were longer logistics and transport times and problems. That all hits efficiency. So the strive to get more efficient, to say cost, wound up hurting them. So the balance between these two is critical for supply chains. And, and there's really a trade-off. So let's look at what those trade-offs are. The, the efficiency from a cost standpoint and effectiveness from customer service standpoint. Well, companies wanna be flexible. They want to be able to um, change what they're producing quickly. They want to be able to change how they're producing toilet paper to get it to us or how they're producing some other product where the demand changes. Uh, the challenge with that, of course, is manufacturing cost. Manufacturing costs up, go up, the more the flexible uh, a company is. How about more economical delivery methods? Companies are constantly trying to find ways to save money. Delivery is one area, but um, if we slow our, uh, our transport down, we're going to have possibly customer dissatisfaction. And going back to the Amazon discussion a few minutes ago, Companies like Amazon have, have changed how we, what our expectations, right? And so if product is slower, we get irritated. Product availability, being able to get whatever we want can drive up our inventory costs. If companies hold a lot of inventory so that when we have disruptions in demand or spikes in demand, we can handle those because we have so much inventory, but of course, the more inventory we carry, the more cost. So you can start to see that these trade-offs, companies don't want to be one way or the other. You don't want to be completely inflexible to keep your manufacturing costs down. You don't want to be sending every single product the slowest, most economical way possible from a, a transport standpoint. And you don't want to carry any inventory. Okay. So companies have to balance this and companies have to figure out where they want to balance it. All right, so let's start talking about maybe some of the things that happened, have happened because of uh, the, the virus and, and demand, some of the demand issues and some other stuff. So I'll call this the, the global supply chain um, and logistics matching game. All right, so uh, we'll start with uh, the increase in demand for pasta since March, 2020. You know, we think about the toilet paper and some of these other the very obvious kinds of products. What about something like pasta, all right? The pasta is easy to store and it can last a long time. And a lot of people eat it. So yeah, 30%, there was an increase, 30% increase in demand for pasta. So if you're having a hard time finding pasta, well, that's, that's a reason um, consumers wanted it. How about Amazon? We'll talk about Amazon again here. Increase in total sales from Q2 of 2019 to 2020. 40%, $25 billion. Amazon has really uh, profited and grown their business because of what has happened with this virus. People are ordering more online. It has changed, are already rapidly changing consumer habits and consumer behavior habits. And you can see it here that it was accelerated because of the, um, of the virus. You hear a lot about panic buying and hoarding and some of these things. Percentage of consumers that actually admitted to panic buying, it's only between about three and 6%. This was a study done in the UK, which is having similar, Europe is having similar kinds of demand issues as the United States, and only three to six people actually admitted it. Now, maybe more were doing it, or maybe some felt like what they were doing is not really panic buying or hoarding, uh, which is possible also. 
But what this shows is that the number of people actually panic buying or hoarding is not that high. It just seems like it. And so when this starts, we see this in the news, we see it in other areas. People are panic buying. Oh my goodness, things are going to change. I need to go out and do it also. Then the last thing I just threw in there, we never, you've heard about drones being used in same day delivery. And actually only about 1% of the entire drone market, um, which, is, which is approaching there and is into the billions of dollars, um, is, is used for product delivery. And I think we'll see that change um, over the years, but that's just something I threw in for you. So you can see through this matching game, this virus accelerated and has changed some of the way that we behave. Um, well, let's get into what happened to all the toilet paper. Let's talk about it. We discuss supply chain management. Hopefully I've given you uh, a pretty good idea of what it is. And this is an, a, a scene that, that I believe we've all been a part of, unfortunately. Uh, all the toilet paper, disposable wipes, other things are all gone, right? Shelves were empty. Um, product has come back now. There was a discussion of a second resurgence of the virus and uptick and people starting to hoard and panic by again, uh, looming on the horizon. Well, so what did happen to the toilet paper? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Here's a picture of a, our lowly toilet paper roll, lowly but incredibly important and functional and vital to our existence. I think many of us would argue. And, and on the right here, you can see there, uh, this is the, the US market for tissue paper, a right, number of different um, types. And you can see that this is a fairly even acceler uh, uh, accelerating demand for product uh, from 2015 to 10 year 2025. And what you'll notice is there's not a whole lot of change year after year. And if you look at this data, if we, if we were to peel it back a little bit more, you'll notice that month after month within each of these columns, there's not a big change. It's very steady. And the toilet paper manufacturers have had work to this model for a lot longer than what is shown here. Well, let's look at what has happened in, since the coronavirus started. You can see here that the change starting on March 7th, right, was a almost 220% increase. And if you look at those two graphs there, okay, a very different story that nobody would have anticipated. And you can see it starts to taper off a little bit. And here's another screen that gives an idea of a the pre-COVID buying period when probably things had not really started to hit yet at least in the United States. And then this preparedness, everything goes up 36%. And then if you look at the extreme buying period, uh, which was in March, a significant increase. All right, so companies are being hit by this. They are producing toilet paper. Their supply chains are, are, are uh, well run, they're efficient, they're effective, they don't need to hold a whole lot of inventory because there's not these jumps in demands. All of a sudden this COVID happens, all right, and here's a picture that maybe some of us have seen. Um, now that everyone else has panicked, well, we have to panic, okay? And it's, it's, it's a behavioral response to, to scarcity or perceived scarcity. Companies, um, the consumers will anticipate they see this in the news. They see that their neighbors are doing it. They go to the store. They hear about whatever it is. Everyone's doing it. I need to get on board because I don't want to be left behind in this panic. Um, so, so that's a demand issue. Demand changes. If you think about uh, what we just discussed with efficiency, effectiveness, and some of these areas of flexibility, you know, it's not just the hoarding. Um, toilet paper industry consists of, of two worlds. Right, you have a consumer market and that's to this low, this small, what I call the small, the lowly roll, toilet paper roll, the small roll, and a commercial market, which is these large rolls that go into, you know, everywhere that's outside the home. And there's not some kind of machine that can turn one into the other. Once these are produced, or once the supply chain for one is moving, it's difficult to be flexible and to turn these, to change it. It, it, it's, it happens, but it takes time. 
And if you think back to the discussion we just had on efficiency and effectiveness for companies to change their whole supply chain that quickly, they have to have an enormous amount of flexibility, which is very costly. And if you think about what I showed you with that toilet paper demand graph, there was no reason for toilet paper companies to have that much flexibility in their supply chains because it just wasn't needed year after year the demand was anticipated and not too difficult. Uh, here's another picture that some of you might have seen. This is a, a dairy farmer dumping milk. I think we, we saw some of these images earlier this year. You saw images of uh, produce being um, rotting in the fields or, or being disposed of in other ways. And the, it's a similar kind of thing. You have dairy farmers that supply to your grocery stores and you have dairy farmers who will supply uh, to schools and other organizations that maybe use the smaller containers. To flip that switch is very difficult because uh, there's dairy farmers who their only customer is the school system. And for the school systems to shut down and suddenly to get that milk into a different configuration, to have that flexibility, to have the other packaging, to have companies they could sell it to, processing firms, those relationships out there, they just aren't flexible enough. Okay, so those are the kind of issues that, that companies are facing. So you have this demand change and then you have the internal supply chain change. Here's another way of looking at it. Let's take Coke products. Um, we have three customers here. These are three of the largest uh, Coke uh, of Coke's customers, Walmart, McDonald's and then the vending machine um, industry, if you if you want to call it that. And these companies have their forecasts that they send to big distribution centers that then send that information on to, um, to the, the Coke bottlers and the manufacturing plants for Coca-Cola. Well, each of these customers are very different. Walmart has Coke products, a wide variety of Coke products in a lot of configurations, cans, different size bottles, two liter bottles, and they may have fountain drinks as well. McDonald's is only going to be fountain drinks almost exclusively. And the, and the, the distribution of the retail, um, the machines, distribution machines are also going to be very limited in the kind of product that they have. Well, if you got rid of one of these, let's say that McDonald's uh, went away, okay, for some reason, it's not easy for the Coke uh, bottlers to quickly convert all of that syrup into these other configurations. It's not something they can do just with the flip of a switch. Um, so that's a, a different, kind of a different way of looking at um, how companies have dealt with the rapid changes in demand in trying to uh, get their supply chains to be flexible, um, to be um, uh, quickly, to be able to, to, to rapidly handle those issues. Something we call the 80% rule is that uh, companies, th there's an idea and a philosophy or theory that companies should not try to produce constantly at 100%. Uh, they need to be able to back ways that they have some flexibility that uh, uh, ensures efficiencies within the operation, but also can ensure some effectiveness. And if companies are constantly trying to push and push, uh, because of demand changes, because of uh, anticipation of, uh, of demand that they don't know what's going to happen and they push the factories, they can actually become less effective and less efficient in what they're doing. One of the other things that we've seen in COVID is that the factories themselves have had problems with uh, people becoming sick, shutting down, and having other issues related to the virus and related to having enough people to run the machines. Uh, to keep the product going. All right, so, so what does this lead to? I'm, I'm giving you some ideas of what supply chain is. I'm giving you ideas of why we got into the situation we got into with demand problems. What is the new norm? Um, should we get used to these shortages? Uh, should we get used to the higher prices? You've seen that uh, beef and some other products have become more expensive. Even soda has become more expensive because of some of the issues in factories, in raw materials, and in changes in demand. Okay, well, hopefully no. Hopefully companies are trying to 
be able to be more responsive, more proactive in this. Predictive models and looking at how to forecast better. Companies are looking at shorter supply chains. I've done research in this area, looking at um, reshoring or insourcing. For so many years, uh, when I worked in industry, and some of you probably have seen this and continue to see it, offshoring, outsourcing was the strategy that all companies used because that was the way to make money. Over the years, these long supply chains have become more of a burden. Costs have gone up. The, there are um, higher uh, uh, raw material costs, higher labor costs, higher transport costs, more uncertainty. And the longer the, um, the logistics chain you have, the more that can go wrong. So companies are trying to bring stuff closer to home. Carrying more inventory. Companies are looking at that again. Uh, companies... Uh, for many years, and, and it's still today a mantra of efficiency, is to keep as little inventory in the pipeline as possible. This gives more flexibility to companies and it reduces their costs and also reduces their risk, which is the last point here of risk management, trying to understand this efficiency effectiveness trade-off. How, how reactive should companies be to changes in demand and how how can they look to uh, um, uh, anticipate them and, and to be able to mitigate some of those problems? And risk management, that's a, a whole nother discussion that we could have an entirely different webinar based on risk discussion and how companies handle that. Um, the answer is also possibly yes. This risk of being too efficient or too effective, companies trying to save money could find themselves in a very similar situation to what we've had earlier this year, trying to be too effective and keep a lot of inventory, be very responsive and be very flexible on our manufacturing can also drive up costs significantly. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, I was reading about this, uh, that the ability to accurately assess supply chain vulnerability, I've read that in a number of places, uh, both in research and in, and in managerial, um, uh, magazines, that this ability to find out where your own supply chain is vulnerable is, uh, is, is critical. And some companies, you know, risk management, resilience, understanding vulnerability, these are really hard things. As managers, uh, people, uh, the people, we don't really completely understand and are not able to see all of the different picture, the, the big picture of what's going on. And I'm doing some research in that area, we call behavioral supply chain risk management. What is it about us as humans that make it difficult for us to predict risk and to figure out how to manage it? Well, so what is the future then of supply chains? Well, that's a, again, a, a, an enormous question we could talk about for an awful long time. Uh, Torsten Pulse, this is the uh, chief supply chain officer for Honeywell had several items, four items that we sort of discussed here. So supply chains of the future. One is the shorter supply chains, bringing the sources closer to manufacturing where there's more control. You don't have such a long supply chain. You don't have logistics. You don't have product that's on the ocean for six weeks um, so that you can more rapidly make changes to your supply chain. You think of a supply chain as a rubber band and, you know, as you as you stretch a rubber band and you stretch it and stretch, it becomes thinner and, and more brittle in a sense. And all you got to do is flick it, right? And that rubber band can break at some point. And that's the, the, that's the danger of the long supply chain. A smarter supply chain through digitalization. This is something that is happening. A lot of companies are looking at this and it is a slow movement toward it, but, uh, but it's critical. You've probably heard of blockchain. You might've heard of internet of things. You might've heard of artificial intelligence, all of these are areas that supply chain managers are trying to figure out how do we digitize the supply chain so that you can see where bottlenecks are, so you can see where efficiencies can be made, so you can see where products are needed throughout the supply chain, where they're stuck, um, and, and how to keep things moving. The, the flip side of that is stronger human capital. It's, it's, I read an article recently that talked about the, the there's, we should drive more efficiencies in the supply chain and get humans out of it. And then Torsten Pills says, that's not the right approach. And Amazon has also looked at this, it's not the right approach because human capital is what 
drives all of digitalization. It drives the strategy and it drives how things are done without that human capital and the emphasis uh, on it, then uh, companies can also uh, have significant issues if they go too far from a digit digitization standpoint. Easy for you to say, right? Finally, resilience is uh, critical for companies. These things are going to happen. The companies, we're not going to be able to predict when the next pandemic is going to come. We can't predict the weather very well. Uh, being resilient, in other words, being able to bounce back, having the mechanisms within the firm and within the supply chain that when uh, issues happen, when disruptions happen, to be resilient and bounce back, that's the future of, of supply chains. Well, that's my uh, talk. Uh, I would love to hear any questions if you have them. Um, and this is the, the, uh, the slide that I always show my students. If you can't reach me by email, uh, claims reach me by email if you have questions and never responds. That's not really true, I always respond, but students get a big, big kick out of that. So there you go. So I will stop sharing and um, that, uh, let's see, I will get us back to, off my screen. Um, thank you. I, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope that was um, interesting and uh, maybe gives you some ideas, some things to think about. Hey, Scott, you're muted. I just gave a very eloquent uh, closing there. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, if you have questions, again, the chat, uh, the chat bubble below, you can enter them there. Um, I do have a, have a question here uh, for you, John. Uh, what, what skill mix defines uh, a great supply chain professional in, in 2020 in a, in a modern time uh, and this is kind of three questions in one so <laughs> how does someone become a supply chain management leader uh, and is there is there information about UF uh, uh, ECU's program that you can share yeah well supply chain is a relatively new um, uh, uh, topic and relatively new relatively new uh, as I mentioned before companies, um, kind of relegated supply chain when certainly in the beginning of my career, we weren't uh, important. It, it's becoming very important now. In fact, um, there are programs like we have here at ECU. We have a new BSBA um, in Bachelor of Science and Business Administration in supply chain management. Other schools are doing this as well uh, that can help prepare you. Uh, a degree can help prepare you to become uh, a supply chain management professional. Uh, I would say there are a number of organizations, CSCMP, uh, which is Raleigh has a round table in that, and ISM, the Institute for Supply Management, is another area. And I think that um, to understand the aspects of, of uh, uh, global uh, supply chains and, and to, to work into that knowledge, and if you're already working in a firm, at, uh, there's a, a professor of mine at Tennessee used to say, and I will relay this to you, uh, I can't claim it for my own, that everything is supply chain management. And it really is. Uh, and my marketing colleagues hate to hear that, but I always claim even marketing supply chain management because it touches everything. So in your own organization right now, what you're doing is probably related to supply chain management. And you just need to search out what is it that I do and how does it relate to supply chain management and move in that direction. But, um, uh, but certainly there are programs uh, and also professional societies and professional accreditations that you can get uh, that can help you. And certainly you could contact me at any time. And, and, and of course, uh, about anything, not just, the, not just that. Awesome. Uh, what can, if anything, oh, hold on. Uh, speaking of supply chain management, is ECU going to offer a program in the offshore wind industry? Uh, say that, can you read that one more time, Scott? Sorry. Sure. 
Uh, is ECU going to offer a program in the offshore wind industry with the two offshore wind farm projects, Dominion in VA and Kitty Hawk? Uh, is the school looking to be a player in that area? Yeah, no, that's a great question. There was a, uh, a grant that um, ECU had been a part of uh, trying to secure um, on offshore wind. And right now, uh, probably within the College of Engineering, there is some uh, uh, areas around that. From a supply chain standpoint, we don't have as much of that. And, uh, but that is a, uh, that, that's a huge area. And I do research in alternative, alternative energy and in sustainability. So it's an important area of mine. And um, I would say, uh, as that kind of industry starts to grow, and if it continues to grow in North Carolina, that ECU should certainly have uh, some kind of a foothold uh, in uh, 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 working uh, with that industry to probably uh, get some of our students to be involved in it. Excellent, thank you for that question, Larry. Uh, another question, your graph showing the spike in toilet paper demand was telling, and you pointed at the challenge of converting from large roll to small roll production. What portion of grocery store uh, issue was the challenge of producing higher quality TP for home use versus hotels and other uses of small roles? Uh, if I understand what you're saying, Scott, correctly, is uh, how, do, how do grocery stores allocate what should be carried on the shelves, is that right? Uh, what portion of grocery store tissue was the challenge of producing? Oh, so when you're, when, uh, when they're, when they're in production, you're producing the quality TP for home versus hotels uh, and other users of small roles. Are there other examples of where the subgroup demand shifts have that dramatic impact on supply chains? Yeah, well, it goes back to the discussion of flexibility, really, and that um, you know there are within within the same company within uh, a PNG or other companies are going to have a variety of products. And certainly toilet paper falls into that. Um, there are some companies that are going to focus on lower quality, some that are going to focus on higher quality, some that are going to offer a variety. And, and those are driven, you know, it's all driven by demand. It's all consumer demand. And uh, as companies, you know, have this fairly level demand for this product, all right, they continue to make the product as that demand and it slowly rises, slowly changes. So companies are not going to alter their production mix and their production lineup uh, unless you know, they see something that indicates that that should happen, all right? So if you're talking about quality or low quality, um, it, it's all demand dependent. And certainly a company, if it can sell more of the low quality stuff um, and it costs them less money to do so, they're certainly going to do that. Um, what usually happens that these kind of uh, toilet paper companies, just about every wants to produce the higher quality because it's typically a higher profit margin on the higher quality product. I hope I answered that question. I hope I asked it properly. <laughs> uh, another question here, and maybe this is for a whole nother event or session altogether. Where are the coins? Is this related in some way? Where are the what? The coins. Every oh, the coins. Says there's no change. Where where have the coins gone? Uh, I think there are on the floor in my daughter's room. Quite <laughs> honestly, she uh, <laughs> found uh, I found a, her her the floor covered in coins. You know, honestly, I, I I don't know. It probably is a supply and demand issue. People are probably hoarding them uh, in some way, and um, I would uh, not. I would be remiss if I tried to answer that, um, but I, I don't know for sure what happened to the coins. I'm guessing that people have hidden them like my daughter, uh, hidden them away in their piggy banks or in a drawer somewhere. And, and now uh, realizing they have so many, they're going to start cashing them in those cash point uh, machines. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, we are uh, running out of time here, but I want to uh, get you out of here and uh, let us, uh, let our, our friends here meet you a little bit and learn a little bit about you. Uh, can you tell us, uh, we've got some rapid fire questions. Can you tell us uh, a few of your favorite, th uh, 
favorite things to do or places to go here in Greenville? Absolutely. I, uh, uh, Greenville's a lot of fun. I love going on the biking trails here. Um, of course, I enjoy Pitt Street uh, and the Uptown Brewery, some of my favorite. Um, and uh, of course, going to ECU football games, which has been a little challenging recently. Excellent. Uh, can you share with us a favorite quote, something you find inspiring? You bet. I, one of my favorite quotes uh, is from our good friend, Thomas Jefferson. And, and I think this is, uh, I thought about this, and this is very applicable uh, to our current situation. He said, I never considered a difference of opinion in politics, in religion and philosophy as cause from withdrawing from our friend. Uh, sometimes we need to remember that, uh, especially with <laughs> things that are going on out there today. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, how about a favorite study, experiment, or bit of research? You know, I'm working on a uh, sustainability project case study with a researcher from MIT right now, and we're looking at Dr. Bronner's, who is a small uh, but growing company, private company in the um, hand sanitizer and hand soap um, industry. And I'm very excited about that. It's very interesting. We're talking to uh, top uh, management at that company. I think it's going to turn out to be a case study. And then also, I think we're going to uh, get that published. Awesome. Awesome. And how about a favorite tool uh, or app that you've been using? That could be an app, kitchen tool, garage, oh, tool, whatever. <laughs> um, you know, I find that uh, I actually like the uh, Microsoft Teams uh, as one of my uh, favorite tools for uh, online discussions, video discussions. I found I like a little bit more. I, I like Zoom. Um, WebEx is okay, but I think that's one of my favorite right now. Excellent. And then do you have a final word or challenge to uh, alumni out there? Uh, yeah, you know, everybody that is, um, that's on this call or people that you talk to, or, or I know that this is going to be made, um, the recording I think is going to be made available. Is that right? Yes. Um, I, I, my, my it, it's, it's a challenge, but more of a, a, um, a request that you uh, continue to support ECU and I'll, I'll tell you, it's really uh, important to our students. Uh, involved alumni uh, are incredibly, um, a, a, an incredible learning tool for my students. I can uh, sit in a classroom and teach students all day long and talk about many of the things we've talked about today um, and, and how to uh, Im improve, uh, how to um, get a good career, have a good career in supply chain management and other areas. And I can have an alumni, ECU alumni come in or, or be part of a program where they hear them speak and they can talk for an hour and um, uh, uh, penetrate and uh, relate to the students so much better. And so uh, your uh, continued involvement in ECU uh, and with, especially with our students is absolutely critical. Awesome, excellent. Well, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you being here. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, John, thanks again for sharing your time and your gifts with us. Uh, look forward to seeing and hearing all the continued fantastic things uh, coming from you and your students in the College of Business. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for checking in. If you want to learn more about uh, the ECU College of Business, uh, Department of Marketing and Supply Chain Management, or Dr. Kirchhoff himself, uh, I am placing those links in the chat feed for your reference. Uh, we hope you'll continue to be engaged with us both in this time of the coronavirus and well afterwards. Does yeah. not look like virtual programming is going away, but I sure am looking forward to seeing uh, more of you eye to eye and shaking hands. Uh, to learn more about the Alumni Association and what we do, go to piratealumni.com. We have an array of virtual resources out there uh, for this time. Uh, and of course, for, for future, please take a look uh, at our other items of interest. Uh, the Alumni Association functions based on gifts from our donors. So if you are so inclined to do so, please consider a gift to the Alumni Association, commensurate with your ability to give and your passion. They are all certainly very appreciated. Uh, keep an eye on your social media outlets as we have more events forthcoming this year. Join us on November 4th uh, with 2008 ECU grad Greg Hedgepath for our Pirates Path series. Greg was a first generation college student and received his bachelor's in economics from ECU. 
uh, and tune in to hear uh, Greg's path to uh, where he is now and his involvement with ECU now, uh, 12 years after he has graduated. So uh, until then, thanks again for joining us. We'll talk soon. Be safe out there and go Pirates. Thank you. Bye-bye.